Welcome to Founders in Biotech. In this podcast, biotech entrepreneurs share their founders' journey and scientific achievements. I'm your host, Sergey Guinka. Today's guest is Professor Alessio Ciulli. Alessio studied chemistry at the University of Florence in Italy. He received a Gates Cambridge scholarship, completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge under the direction of Chris Abel in a collaboration with Aztec Pharmaceuticals. During this time, Alessio worked with biophysical methods to study protein ligand interactions. Alessio stayed for a postdoc and college fellowship at the Cambridge University, moved to work on structure-based and fragment-based drug discovery, again with Chris Abel, but also with Tom Bondell. In 2009, Alessio had a research visit at Greg Cruz Group at Yale University, supported by a HFSP short fellowship. He returned back to Cambridge and began his own independent research. In 2013, Alessia moved to his laboratory at the University of Dundee, became an associate professor and since 2016 a full professor in chemical and structure biology. He is now director of the new center for targeted protein degradation, a super exciting field in drug discovery. It's the first of its kind um, and it's aimed to bolster and consolidate uh, the University of um, Dundee's world reading position in the field of chemical biology that is currently revolutionizing drug discovery. Alessia co-founded the biotech company Amphista Therapeutics. The company is focused on developing therapeutics leading to targeted protein degradation. That's a tremendous uh, career, Alessio. Thank you for joining us today on Founders in Biotech. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you for this introduction, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, uh, for me to be part of this, and, um, and I look forward to, to the discussion and to sharing uh, some of my experiences. Great. We want to learn more about you. What inspired you to become a scientist in, in chemist early, early on? Where did you grow up, and uh, why chemistry? Uh, sure, I, and I, I think this is a great question, and uh, um, uh, and I think the uh, if we all look at our own uh, careers and histories, there's always uh, some triggers. There's always something in our background, uh, whether it's our family or our education or or our early early years that uh, that inspired us. And and um, and it's usually uh, a passion. And for me, the passion was actually. Uh, related to chemistry, I, I was very passionate about chemistry. I was passionate about this idea uh, that we could understand the structure of things, of, uh, uh, of the things we could touch, or the things we could, you know, the air we could, uh, we could breathe, and uh, and what we could see, and and that structure uh, and, and formed by atoms, and then form, you know, coming together and organized around structure would then uh, would then lead to to materials properties and molecules yeah so um and 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 one of the things that triggered that uh, was very simple my parents uh, um, aware of my interest uh, studying chemistry at school they one day came back and they bought uh, the the sort of uh, little chemist you know these little boxes with a lot of uh, a lot okay. of salts and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of tools uh, to to mix things and investigate uh, uh, how reactions happen and uh, um, and how to how to do a little lab at home and that really got me hooked. I mean, uh, I I would spend hours and hours uh, and I would do some some readings and research and I I remember uh, always going into the city center of Florence, my hometown, where there was a, a little pharmacy. Uh, it, but right next, actually, to um, uh, to Palazzo Vecchio, <laughs> right in the center, uh, a pharmacy called Bizzarri, and they they used to sell all of these uh, powders and all of these salts, and um, and there was a, a very old fashioned pharmacy from the eighteen hundreds, and buying a lot of a lot of those and take them back home and uh, be be excited, amazed by the coloring and uh, you know very very bright mm. coloring from these salts and then making solutions, mix them and see things precipitating and, uh, and learning from that. And, and I would do this completely in my spare time at the expense of what the actual courses I was supposed to study. 
So I would, you know, date it back to that. And then, and, and then when I started actually studying chemistry um, at, uh, at the Lyceum, I had already done all my readings. So um, it was kind of a bit easier <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, I totally can relate to that. So my, my grandfather was a chemist. And when he talked like with passion about those reactions in atoms of what you can actually do to solve uh, problems, so always like stayed with me this this tool that we have with chemistry create new um, new molecules or even reactions to create yes. something new yes um, and, and my, my parents were not chemists my parents were not scientists uh, in fact they they actually didn't have um uh, sort of uh high high school education even so i was just you know i was just doing this by myself uh, uh with their support and their encouragement great. Great. So, so you already in your early early years, you you work with experimentally actually hands on um, experiments in chemistry, and then uh, for your graduate study, you you move to NMR and work with matrix metalloproteases that was um, uh, quite hyped at this like at those days. Uh, there were many hopes. Um, was at this stage already like the, the small molecules, the, the fragments. Uh, part of this um, of the studies. Yes, it, the, I was certainly aware of the concept, and um, and in fact, one of the most inspiring readings uh, at the time for me were papers from, um, um, uh, you know, uh, Steve Fezzik uh, and his group um, at Abbott at the time, who had published some um, some really uh, fantastic work, inspiring work, looking at very small molecules and how they could bind to proteins. Uh, you know, there's a paper in Science, 1996, very influential, called SAR by NMR. And, and there were uh, actually two back-to-back -back papers in JAX from his group that uh, that I was, uh, you know, I, I avidly read all of that, uh, all of those papers uh, around that time. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my entry into the field was almost adventitious. Uh, I actually, uh, I actually specialized I, I did my degree in chemistry. I specialized in supramolecular chemistry, and then mm. actually did an, did a, a one month internship in in an. Uh, so I, I spent one year as an Erasmus student at the University of Cambridge, which mm. was very influential to me as a young kid. I was you know twenty two, um, and uh, and I studied there and uh, and I, I and I loved it there and and I thought you know I want to I want to maybe come back one day but I stayed for one month and I, I worked in inorganic uh, uh, chemistry in, in in a lab but then once back to Florence um, you know my favorite my most inspiring teacher Ivano Bertini so I. I I loved him, and I, I, you know, the the way he inspired us as students, and uh, and the the work that he was doing. So I said, I really want to do a project with you, and then he basically said, Well, look, I think what uh, what would be great is if we could do some screening. There's now all these libraries, and you can do screening virtually. And actually, my for, initial foray was computational, you know, uh, docking and virtual screening. Mm -hmm. But then their lab was mainly experimental. So then I started doing some NMR. Uh, and at that time, we realized that uh, the the next frontier were not actually screening large molecules, was becoming more and more screening smaller molecules, but it was still early days. And and then I realized that one of the uh, reading uh, and, uh, and learning from the uh, from the publications and uh, and uh, and the work in the field, uh, being very curious, I realized one of the actual uh, expert uh, group uh, was this new company called Astex. Um, at the time, Aztec Technology, uh, which then became Aztec Therapeutics, mm -hmm. shortly after I went back to Cambridge, and that was one of the motivation for me to to think, oh, maybe I can go back to Cambridge, which I liked really a lot. I'm I'm I'm, I'm learning about the fragment field, and maybe, and I was fortunate enough. Chris Abel, one of the founders of um, of uh, of Aztec, had a PhD position. Uh, which the title really enticed me was novel approaches, novel fragment-based approaches to to study protein ligand interactions, and uh, and that was what I was working on. And I thought, uh, you know, for my PhD, I could learn from from some of the world's experts, and I could be yeah. back to the place that inspired me. And 
and that's where that's where I ended up um, uh, for my PhD. But yes, my work at the time had been with matrix metalloproteinases because they were very well characterized systems yeah. uh, to which you know Fezic had had done had shown some work with fragments, and uh, and we wanted to see if we could combine computational screening with NMR and uh, some quite quite a few publications that emerged uh, from that area. It was a new area from Ivano Bertini's lab. He was director already of a big NMR center in Florence. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's what, uh, what it was at the time. What, what, what year are we, are we talking about? Because um, like um, you're quite well known in, in the drug discovery uh, community, but this link between NMR fragments and modeling happens early on uh, uh, du during your career. It, it did indeed exactly this was this was a, a sort of early early 2000 2001 actually so i oh. i graduated uh sorry 2001 i graduated with ivano in february 2002 and so i actually started uh, my project in late 2000 early 2001 and if you think about it physics uh, trans, you know transformational paper in science was 1996 yeah and uh, you know around that time uh, uh, pharma was starting to get more and more into this there were already some nice papers on uh, things like water logs from Claudio Dalvit was around 2000, you know, saturation transfer difference yeah. was around 2001. So it was, it was really early days. Yeah. I mean, a medicine chemistry is still skeptical about pregnant based drug discovery, but you, um, like, uh, they, they want to see the affinity in order to start working, but it's still, uh, like early days of fragment based drug discovery where you, um, connected like the screening method, um, um, like the fragment uh, paradigm, uh, but also the modern. So, I'm, it's it's a quite exciting to see this connection um, early on. Uh, yeah, and it makes for me now a lot of sense uh, from like what what we see what is coming out of your lab. Yeah, I I mean I I, I wasn't so much aware of that uh, at the time, uh, but of course I became aware. Uh, more and more later when it became clear that then you had to get some chemists to work on those fragments. But but I actually always felt, uh, you know, Fezic was right in the thinking and actually yeah. the field was right because I think actually made, in my mind, in my, in my naive and sort of uh, uh, ingenuous uh, uh, mind, uh, 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 you know, not, not ingenuous, I should say, I <laughs> mean, uh, 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 the disingenuous mind, <laughs> uh, actually, you know, working with much smaller molecule made a lot of sense because it seemed, uh, it seemed much easier. Uh, and, uh, and it seemed that, uh, detecting those weak interactions, uh, uh would be really, re really conceptually and fundamentally interesting. And when one could build upon that much more rationally. Yeah. And so, um, um, and, and, and so I think that's, that's, um, that was, uh, but but that was still uh, that was still quite niche at the time. Yeah, yeah. It's I had to say it's still, it still it still is somehow. Um, you you touch like the way you spoke about the coverage and the ecosystem. Like you you've been there for a month, then you returned. It kind of um, what was what was different? What was striking personally to you um, about uh, like scientific research in, in Cambridge? So I really enjoyed the teaching and I really enjoyed um, the, the aspect of conveying concepts simply um, and deeply. And, and I really enjoyed the college system. I thought as a student that could be a, a really thriving environment. And, um, and I, you know, I, I generally enjoyed uh, uh, the experience of living abroad as well, and into into a prestigious university with with a with a very caring and and college system where you meet really exciting people, new yeah. you know people from different areas, people from different nationalities, uh, that were studying topics completely different from from your own, and uh, um, so that really appealed to me. Oh, great! So um, after after the after Cambridge, you 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 get a, a scholarship, um, like Human Frontier Science Program, and um, you visit Craig Goose, uh, which and how how selective were you were about um, like this topic? He's published already some work on on on, pro, on Protex, 
Um, and what, what, how was the link between um, like products and FPDD and like protein directions? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I met first Craig in uh, September 2007. So maybe let me explain oh, a little bit because we were talking yeah. about 2001 and it's, uh, yeah. it's quite a few years that passed. So, so I did my PhD then with Chris Abel and we, we studied uh, um, biophysical methods to study uh, weak uh, protein ligand interactions. So um, I developed uh, quite a lot of uh, sort of uh, enzymology study on an enzyme about, you know, ternary complexes. The enzyme was binding to substrate fragment binding so you know mm -hmm. those concept of cooperativity between two binders emerged already I, I became familiar already back then and then biophysical methods nmr lots of uh, isothermal titration calorimetry we were we wanted to look at so basically aztecs was um, primarily a, an x-ray crystallography company and the, one of the goal of my phd was to investigate alternative methods in solution in addition to x-ray crystallography to so that we could study binders and fragments and ligands and enzyme uh, substrate interactions. And so NMR and solution again, but, but also mass spectrometry and uh, IT, uh, isothermal saturation calorimetry, substrate resonance and many others. And, um, and then I, I stayed on um, uh, to learn crystallography and actually do it uh, and, and, and do a bit more, uh, you know, getting actually to, at the time, Chris and Tom were trying to bring back fragments into academia uh, to tackle neglected diseases and mycobacterium tuberculosis was one big one that we started to work on. Mm -hmm. And then later on, tackle protein-protein interaction. And so I really wanted to, to then actually do it and learn more about the design of the molecules, uh, uh, structure-based design and actual fragment-based design and learn about how we can design and build this molecule. And, and so, uh, and I started, uh, um, I finished my PhD 2006 and, uh, and I was uh, deep into all this work and to my uh, postdoctoral uh, and college research fellowship work uh, back in 2007. And, uh, and I met Craig at a, at a meeting in, in the UK, actually in Manchester. And um, and we really clicked. Um, you know, he he had seen our work, and uh, and um, he was really interested uh, to hear more about it. But he would have missed my lecture, and uh, and I'd heard him his lecture, so I really liked it. Uh, and I was intrigued by how his lab was combining chemistry and biology, and how uh, you know he presented about this protac. And I must admit, I I wasn't aware about. Uh, that work uh, and I learned about it for the same time and coming from the fragment field you know I saw those molecules and they looked like beasts to me and I thought okay these are really big and uh, uh, but actually we, we, we clicked uh, and then we had uh, very exciting discussions at dinner about how we could work together because he was uh, he was saying I'm really interested in in, in developing new ligands and uh, I've seen your work and 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 uh, you know and I said well I, I think it would be really interesting to maybe apply this to to this field and we really talked and uh, clicked and then uh, you know he said well why don't you come and visit and uh, that happened two years later a year and a half later uh, writing a grant in between and getting it funded and uh, and uh, and visiting his lab for a few months uh, that that uh, basically triggered our, our connection and our collaboration. Oh, great. Was it a conference where you met? Yes. Oh, okay. Good. It's a value of conferences. Um, yes, absolutely. And, and uh, this is the power of this is the power of uh, of uh, uh, meeting with uh, with people, learning about what others are doing, and have an open mind uh, because you 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 know you don't you, you wouldn't you you might not be able to necessarily know where your career could go but a a, a, a you know a an encounter uh could be a trigger yeah yeah definitely so um so you you visit Craig Cruz you you work together uh for six months then you return to Cambridge uh you it was actually four months it was actually very small four months oh, okay okay yeah, four months, uh, four months you return um uh, still work with your research group but then you move to um uh, uh, to dundee in 2013 and like uh i've heard like some colleagues were the postdocs in, in idea what i see in externally that um a early on like even 10 years ago already there were like drug discovery um in ecosystem um, emerging and now it's kind of a world class leading research environment. So um, tell, tell us a bit about the, the transition to, to Randy. 
Yes. So, um, so actually, uh, you know, going back to, to those four months at Yale, actually, while I was at Yale, I, I, I received the notification that uh, my application to become group leader and get my own funding to start my own group was successful, which was uh, kind of timely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, so then uh, when I returned to Cambridge, I knew I was going to start my group because I had the funding, I had the fellowship. And so I started the group there and build the group uh, over the, the next few years. And actually the focus of the group at the time, we started uh, wanting to, to investigate the protein-protein interactions and D-free ligases. You know, we felt that that was the required next step, uh, actually, ultimately, potentially for Protax, but uh, there was a lot of interest in protein-protein interaction. And we thought it was the right thing to focus on that. And in fact, mm-hmm. you know, the key discovery then that we did to get in collaboration with Craig was uh, to develop the DHL ligand, which is obviously a... A, a, an inhibitor of a protein protein interaction in the first instance, you know, mimicking that peptide to bind to that site and disrupt the protein protein interaction. But of course, as a binder to that E3 ligase, then we, 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 we reasoned, we posited that if developed to, to, to suitable property, on the one hand, it could be an inhibitor of a protein-protein interaction. And on the other hand, it could be good for Protax, which we, mm-hmm. we felt uh, that could be, could be a good development. So, so, uh, so we, together, we then published uh, three back-to-back papers in 2012. And at the time, my group was still in Cambridge. And uh, we had started working on other protein-protein interaction, notably, for example, on bromo domains uh, at the other end uh, of the spectrum. And that's where then Later on, we brought the two together uh, with our Protax uh, approach, right? And uh, um, but yes, yeah, so so um, you know, Dundee. I, I became aware of uh, the environment at Dundee through uh, an interaction and a short visit, uh, and and uh, sharing uh, some other early work. And I, I was uh, truly inspired um, by the collegiality of the environment, by the vibe, by the. Uh, and and by the sheer the sheer capabilities and uh, and potential uh, for growth of the environment, I could sense that the, there was very strong focus on on um, translation and and innovation, and there were capabilities for doing real world drug discovery, and uh, and there was very strong biology, so our chemistry could really thrive, and that 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 would be. It was a you know a unique environment, uh, and st- I still believe it still is, and we continue to to do you know to 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 thrive and and to innovate and and to build our environment here. But uh, but uh, you know it was a unique environment, uh, um, a unique place where I could really take my uh, the science that we were doing to uh, deeply uh, and profoundly, and uh, uh, and so. Uh, and so we moved the lab in 2013 and uh, in April um, uh, established very quickly uh, with our group. We moved as a group of nine and uh, and, and then uh, built from that. Um, on, on, so you, you are an academic professor. You, you already worked with the industry early on and um, now you, you, you co-founded Afista Therapeutics. Um, how did the idea for a, a biotech company um, emerge. Well, uh, you know, this, 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 uh, uh, there's always a, uh, exciting, uh, opportunities and ideas float all the time. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, always an important thing to keep in mind. But, uh, but I think that for, for the case of Amphista, clearly there was, uh, a combination of, uh, our insights into uh, how products worked and uh, and the mechanism of targeted protein degradation and and some early ideas and thoughts and uh, provocative um uh, you know uh, questioning and hypothesis about how we could we could already begin to address some of the uh foreseen you know anticipating potential limitations uh, of the existing uh, mechanisms and, uh, and and beginning to think about how we could now expand to new mechanism mm-hmm. and um, and sort of formulate uh, some provocative science that could uh, that could uh, demonstrate and convince ourselves and the investors uh, that there could be the potential for an exciting new differentiated company that could then develop very strong therapeutic uh, pipelines and, uh, and, a, and a therapeutic and a, and a platform technology 
uh, to, um, uh, to then uh, uh, develop the next generation of targeted therapeutics, uh, targeted protein degradation therapeutics. Uh, and that was the idea. And then, you know, the idea, uh, then you need the people and you need the capital, but you actually yeah. need, uh, uh, need the team and how you put together the team. All right. Talk about like starting what uh, from the scientific perspective, what is the number one step uh, uh, the scientists like they have maybe an idea to start a company based on some research? What should they consider before starting a company? Um, like, what would you say to s scientists who, who don't have the economic background? Uh, like, what should they consider first before making the first step towards starting a company? I think, I think there has to be a combination of a, a number of things that have to happen, you know, in the right way at the right time. And as I said, it's a combination of idea, people, uh, and, uh, and capital that has to come in. And in order for mm -hmm. the capital to come in, then investors have to be convinced that there's, there's an opportunity, an investable pro value proposition to that idea, uh, and, and to that team and to that enterprise. Um, but, but, you know, that's usually the end goal. And I think to work backwards from it, um, there, there, there has to be a passion and a drive to ask questions. There has to be a desire to innovate and there has to be, a, a, you know, ultimately a motivation, uh, in our field, which is drug discovery and molecular therapeutics and, uh, and biotechnology to, you know, to make medicines that matters that ultimately can impact the lives of patients, then I think working backwards from that uh, can be easier uh, with that drive and that motivation. Yeah, I think that's, that's very helpful, like asking questions, having a passion, because there, there, will, be, there will be problems that's part of the journey and awesome. uh, the, drive, the, the drive to innovate, uh, great. Uh, that's helpful from the scientific perspective, um, I think. So, and you you come, like you come from from Dundee, and in terms of there are hubs, there are global hubs where biotech is thriving. Um, what would you recommend, like building a company in a in a in a hub, or or sh should a scientist consider? But like, I'm going to spin out of the university, and uh, how important is the ecosystem? Is the hub? I think that I think that the ecosystem we need to consider it globally more and more, and of course it's in, you know there are uh, remarkable ecosystems uh, geographically of, of you know remarkable area of concentration um, that are very well known in the United States is you know the Boston area and some other mm -hmm. East Coast area or, or, or this, uh, you know California. Um, uh, West Coast in in uh, in the UK is a golden so-called golden triangle. Uh, there may be other hot spots around Europe, um, but I think we need to more more and more consider the world globally. And because uh, actually innovation doesn't necessarily happen just in those places um, by definition, and uh, there's a lot of exciting opportunities and science that happen in other places. And uh, and we need we need to feel I think we need to be open minded about how we encourage, enable, and, uh, and lower the barrier to, to, to innovation, also in areas where perhaps there is an as concentration of capital and uh, venture and uh, industry. Um, and, and, and I think, that, I think that that is going to be a good thing globally uh, to the whole of the ecosystem and will maximize uh, uh, innovation worldwide. And so I think that it has to be a plurality of that. And so, so we, we are obviously outside of some of those ecosystems. And so, so yeah. we, we work, we work with them, uh, to think about ways in which we can all help each other and, 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 uh, and, uh, and work together. Uh, but certainly often, uh, you know, there are, there are, uh, challenges to grow companies um, in certain areas versus others, um, and then the system is, is changing and it's moving very fast. Now it's global drug discovery. Uh, you know, yeah. there's lots of contra research organization, and the most most startups and spin outs they would not do things 100% only internal. So yeah. you know, you, it's more and more a global world. Yeah, and um, in terms of like talking about geography and mindset, like um, it's it's a uh, 
probably a more provocative uh, question, but um, uh, what have you learned uh, like from the European mindset? Um, what challenges one can face that are probably avoidable when you approach with a European mindset, but everything has to be in place and everything is already described. Like about like, I hear a lot the, the where like European mindset is not risk taking. Have you observed something something um, like that can help uh, to overcome this early on and not by by failing and learning from that? But uh, like they say, think big, right? Think big. Um, in science, we have this rapid iterate, like you, you have a hypothesis, experiment data. And um, what was helpful and what have you observed, like the European mindset, can it limit the growth potential? I mean, product is a, it's a, is a fantastic new modality. Like, and I think that's a great example to talk about like going big. Uh, but the science is is also rooted in in, in European uh, research. Yes, I think you're you're touching uh, on a very important point, which is attitude to risk, right? And mm -hmm. and, and um, a level threshold of risk adverseness. Um, but I would actually then not just uh, say risk; I would actually even say failure. And mm -hmm. so perception and uh, an attitude to failure. And so I think if you're too risk adverse and if you're too worried about failing, that could be a big stumbling block to innovation because actually only by failing you learn and only by failing you innovate. And, you know, the, 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 the discoveries and, uh, are often serendipitous and they're often the, the results of uh, numerous failings. And, uh, uh, and so I think culturally we probably need to be better uh, at um, at encouraging uh, that type of attitude that are in Europe. I think there are uh, um, other cultures uh, where where maybe that level is a little lower. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I think that's important. Uh, but of course, ultimately, you have to start somewhere. You've got to start with what you've got. And so um, there's always going to have to be an element of trying to have a vision uh, where you, you sort of get a gut feeling, an intuition of where you need to be so that you start preparing your territory. Because it's all well and good enough to think big, but if you think too big and you think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to to Saturn tomorrow, you actually can't do it today, right? And, uh, and uh, you, you know, then you, then you just keep failing, not because it's bad to fail, you just keep failing because you're not quite ready yet and, and it's far fetched what you're trying to do. So I think, I think also we shouldn't put too much emphasis on the think big necessarily because uh, we could we could convey the wrong message. Uh, ultimately, you know, it's important to be the signal uh, uh, over the background and the noise in what one's doing, yeah. and that signal could be something that then enables the next jump, and that doesn't always need to be. A, a, a game changing uh, uh, and a complete paradigm shift because that's again a, a false hope that we like to fool ourselves. That's yeah. that's what we should be doing. In reality, it doesn't work like that. You know, science. You know, it, it's a long and winding road, and it goes. You know, um, it, it, into segments. It's never a straight line. It's never like a big uh, a, a big. Uh, a, a big uh, transformation, and there's often small steps that lead to 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 more inflection points. And so, it's preparedness to those inflection points, so that you can get there quicker, faster, and better, uh, and really then find a path towards something that's transformational uh, and that matters. I like it a lot, like preparedness for turning points. Uh, that's 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 really uh, that's really helpful. Um, being prepared for, for, for the unexpected data. Um, as I say, uh, expect the unexpected. Uh, okay, uh, more like for, for founders who already maybe have a company um, and stay considering reaching out to pharma. Um, and um, I mean, Afista has, has done um, like uh, there are deals that are uh, published that there is a collaboration between the the, the uh, is a, like a biotech company and like typical biotech pharma deals. What would you like? What advice would you give to those founders who are considering to reach out to to pharma companies already talking? 
uh, non-confidential, how should they approach? Uh, what is the logic behind those those deals? Um, yes, I think these deals are, are very important. Um, and uh, they're important for a variety of reasons. I mean, the acid test ultimately for any technology or any modality or any uh, discovery or innovation or, or proprietary uh, platform or whatever you want to call that an academic and their group or a biotech or a startup has, the acid test is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, industry um, essentially um, taking that up and uh, and being convinced about it. And so so doing those deals uh, become very important. And it's important because it, it builds credibility, it builds profile, and, and it helps for a startup company as well in terms of diversifying um, a mix of what they do uh, on their own and what we do collaboratively. Uh, and it's often a win-win. I mean, the best uh, such uh, collaborations usually involve win-win where the, the company brings in something, the, the academic uh, the group uh, uh, and the, and the, uh, and the pharma oh, and, and the startup brings something and then the two is more than the sum of the part, very much like a protac. Yeah. <laughs> like so I think that cooperation... Yeah. And it's, it's a winning point. So I think I think there's a, there's, a, there's often a perception of skepticism and and fear yeah. uh, of interacting with industry. Are they going to s- steal everything and run away? And, uh, <laughs> and of course they will want to establish things internally. But uh, um, but I don't think that um, I think founders should be less uh, less risk adverse and less uh, fearful of that. And so my own perspective has been. Are remarkably positive. So already since 2016, uh, I established a, a very strong collaboration with Ingelheim, our very first, and then ever since uh, we've stricken many more and we now have remarkable uh, interactions and partnerships and programs jointly with, uh, with Pharma within our new Center for Targeted Protein Degradation at Dundee, which we've recently uh, announced and we're opening very soon, which is a really exciting new development at Dundee. To, to bolster our capability and to build, uh, which I'll be delighted to, to tell a, a bit more, uh, and uh, um, and and that's grown and that's uh, really expanded and is continuing very strong. We since uh, struck another deal with the company Almiral, and Amfista, um, uh, after uh, you know remarkable Series A and B investments, very recently announced two very big deals. Um, uh, one with. Uh, Merck AG um, and uh, another one with uh, uh, Bristol Myers Squibs and uh, and these 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 deals are 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 important and uh, um, and they offer tremendous opportunities. So I would uh, I would strongly advise uh, to you know founders to uh, to to always be very open to to interact with the with the pharma industry and uh, and of course not uh, not just take up any any deals uh, at any time and you know we often spend a lot of time thinking about these deals we we you know have long discussions we and uh, sometimes we, we you know we had discussions and things don't progress and sometimes things click and and, and the deals get stricken so don't just jump and uh, and uh, uh, jump on the first one the first uh, interest uh, um from pharma there's a you know um, there's a lot uh, gained on sharing and, and, and getting feedback actually from the industry. So don't hesitate to get feedback from them about your uh, your innovative work or program or platform and to and to to hear about. And actually, if they say it's not for us just yet or we're not interested for this and that, don't take it personally. That could actually be a good thing. Somebody else might be. There yeah, may be nothing absolutely. wrong with your technology. It may just be something with that particular partner. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, get the feedback from like from your experts. Maybe they don't get an idea, but you move on, not taking it personally. Uh, maybe they'll like it, and like uh, one can learn a lot uh, for uh, for technology and application um, yes. from from this interaction. So uh, you mentioned that something something's going on in Dundee. There is a new center. Let's let's talk briefly about this. What is happening? Because uh, scientists listening to this podcast might be interested. To, to be part of it or and um, oh, bring yes. their sounds so, or move move there. 
Yes, yeah, so we're really excited about this new development uh, at the University of Dundee. I, I feel very fortunate uh, to to be the director and so have the opportunity to shape uh, uh, shape the, the center's uh, establishment. And so I'm the founder and director of the new center. Uh, and so it's a first of its kind. It's a, it's a first of the one you know one place. Uh, physical dedicated laboratory space, uh, state-of-the-art laboratories uh, uh, dedicated to an academic uh, uh, but also translational uh, center, uh, university-based, um, and uh, and it will bolster and consolidate the uh, um, University of Dundee's uh, world-leading position uh, in targeted protein degradation and more generally these ideas of bringing proteins together right which is as i, I explained is now a new a new concept a new yeah. modality and a new ways of thinking uh that is truly revolutionizing um the industry and uh, how we develop medicines that matters uh but also how academically we think right about how how we can now probe the cell how we can probe biology and how we can design molecules that can be useful uh, as a first step towards enable new therapeutics uh, and and new targets and uh, a new understanding of disease, and so uh, so we're really excited. Uh, uh, we we have a strapline of values: innovate, collaborate, and inspire. And I hope that uh, you know in this podcast today that uh, uh, we've been talking about exactly that: how we we innovate, how and we think about innovating, collaborate uh, to work together, share, and and be open. Um, and we do a lot of scientific philanthropy in the center and, and, and we That's really subscribe really to that and then how we, and how we inspire the next generation. So if anyone's uh, excited and want to join us in this journey, uh, I'm open. My, uh, direct messaging are, lines are open and they, uh, and I'll be delighted, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to receive any inquiries and uh, to answer any questions. Great. So talking about reaching out to you, what's, what's the best way to, to reach out? Oh, yeah. So I'm very active on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn. You can direct message me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Feel free to do so. Um, also, my email address is, uh, is available from the, comp from the university website, uh, in my group website, um, a.chuliadundee.ac.uk. So you drop me an email, uh, as well. So either of these, uh, either of these, uh, uh, ways, I'll be delighted to, to read, uh, uh and consider your, your, your contact. Great. Sounds like your your door is always open. Um, thank you so much, Alessio, for joining us today on Farmers and Biotech. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for being with us on the Founders in Biotech podcast. In the next episode, we'll take a technical deep dive with Alessio Chuli into the science of targeted protein degradation and protex. Do you want to raise awareness of cutting-edge science, emerging technologies and innovation? Please do reach out to us and visit foundersinbiotech.com. We'd like to thank Cecil Baring for supporting this initiative. See you in the next episode.